And I thought, well, as I'm coming here and I'm going to talk, why don't I try and talk about something that means a lot, matters a lot, and has some sort of influence? The talk is uh, something very dear to my heart, and it's about how Wargaming, the company, the people, the games, saved my gaming soul. The talk itself is a bit of a, a little ride. Now, to be fair, about halfway through, it's a little sad. But stay with me, it's got a great ending. So far, so good? Right, so who am I? I'm Paul Barnett. I've been making games for 20-something years. I've made them on my own. I've made them with big companies. I've made them in different countries. Some have been gloriously successful. Some have been terrible. Some I really liked working on, and nobody bought them. Others I couldn't care about, and they keep selling. I've been very happy. I've been very sad. And it's that that I want to talk about, and where I am, and why I'm at Wargaming, and why I love Wargaming. So here we go. As a game maker really early on, paper, glue, pen. Make games all over the place. RPG games, all that. And then I went and found bulletin board door programs. Really old stuff that you don't care about. And from that, I learned scripting. And from that, I then learned how to make proper games, allegedly. And then I went and made a game that went on the World Wide Web, which grew up to be the internet. And that did very well. And I thought about what I was like back then. And I was very focused. And I was happy and thoughtful. I moved between the two. I had an awful lot of direction. I was damn sure I was going to make a game. And I had a target. Get my game out and get people to play it and then pray they liked it. I wasn't very good at thinking about the money. And I wasn't very good about future thinking. I also wasn't very good about my time. Lots of stuff I did then was very inefficient. It still is at the places. I did discover then with design a couple of things that I think are important. That's where I learned that design that is the design I like is design that I put in and works. It's no other design. If it's, if it's not in the game and it doesn't work, I don't care what it is. It's not design. It's just something written down somewhere. It's also where I discovered that design isn't certain, which is terrifying as a designer. Because you want to deal in certainty. And yet here you are coming up with a design, putting it in a game, and then players hate it. Or you put a design into a game, and they like the wrong thing. Or they do something weird with it. And you look at them and go, why are you doing that? It's not supposed to do that. So design isn't certain. Careful about design. So there I was a game maker, and I hit a lot of frustrations. I'll tell you what the frustrations were. Tech improvements would turn up, and people would pretend that they were design improvements. And they weren't. But everyone told us they were. I'll give you a very basic example. When we move from 2D to 3D. By moving to 3D, clearly, all this new design would happen. But it didn't. It was just the same thing. In some cases, it went backwards. Design got worse with technical improvements. Madness. I was confused at this part in my life. I was a bit lost. I was very tired. I remember being very tired back then. I was a little afraid. Why? Because these technological improvements had changed the landscape of the games I was making. Budgets, staff, content, publishing, developers, platform, payment models, dot-com boom and bust. Ouch. It's a very dangerous time to be an independent game maker. If you weren't careful, you were going to get killed. So as a result, I moved house again. At this point, this is my 11th house move. But I moved house and decided to solve my problems. Why did I have the frustrations? I needed to move on. I moved on and I went for bigness. Now, if you're going to go for bigness, there are only two ways to do it. You can go and find money off people, believe in what you're doing, risk everything. The wargaming method. It's true. It's a, good, it's a good, it's good method. Or you can go work for bigness, which means go work for big companies and do it that way. I decided to go work for bigness. What did I discover? Well, bigness gave me all the things I was worried about. Budget, planning, headcount, IP, platforms, delivery, payment models. But bigness came with tons and tons of problems. Thank you very much. <laughs> the biggest problem with bigness is that ideas were hard. They would get altered, changed, attached to other ideas, diluted, unfocused, unfinished. You'd have to argue with people who were idiots all the time. And then they'd still say no. 
the cult of internet turned up, which made being a game maker really, really hard. It was already really hard. We already didn't get any money and no one liked us, but now the internet hated us. Worse, the internet would hate you even if you were trying to tell them the honest answer truthfully with a good heart. Now you just get made into a meme. And the timing's got really bad on memes. It's now a server ping. This is very, very distressing if you're just trying to make games. Never mind the fact that if you're working with bigness, there's lots of people I work with. It's not just me. It's not just, why are you doxing me and being mean to my family? So that was really hard. And then the will of the internet. Executives would turn up with the will of the internet in their heads. This is what players want. This is what I've seen. This is what Twitter is trending. And the problem with the will of the internet is the internet doesn't know what it actually wills. And sometimes you give it what it wants and it still hates you. Very frustrating. I was still very focused, but I was unhappy and confused. I was thinking about the future and I was thinking about my time. I can't make games forever. I realized I had to move on if I was going to solve the problems. So there you are. The industry I was working was slow. Ideas were getting diluted. There was a lack of focus. It was business over joy, which I understand. They have a share price. There was a lot of planning. I remember a lot of planning. Restructuring. We were always restructuring. And after we restructured, we would plan to have another restructure. We used process a lot. Big companies use process. They use process and delay when they lack confidence. If you're not sure how they're spending your money, force them into process and delay. That'll at least slow down them wasting money. And then the three truths of bigness. If you wanted it quick, it would take us forever. If we agreed we were going to do it cheaply, it would end up costing a fortune. And because it was a business-wide initiative that we can all be part of, it would be in secret meetings and folders and documents that we didn't share with anyone, which was just nuts. So that led me to a problem. I could stay where I was. I certainly was getting paid a lot of money. I, I, was, I was working. I was in California. But I wasn't playing very many games. And I wasn't enjoying the conversations. And I was quite miserable. My reality needs imagination, and my imagination needs reality. A bit like a canvas needs paint. And I'd done some interesting things, and some terrible things, and some things that had worked. And I remembered a phrase a friend of mine said, those diamond moments, they were just very patient bits of coal. Just waited enough. And I'd got fed up of compelling arguments that were ultimately stupid. If something's stupid, who cares if it's compellingly said? It's still stupid. Or to put another way, if it isn't worth doing it, it isn't worth doing it well. And that's where I was in my time in the OCCO. It was madness. I needed a challenge, and I needed to do something else. And it was my wife, wherever she is, there she is, who came up with the answer. I was in California and a little bit unhappy. And she said, what you need to do is go work on a game you love. And I ranted and railed. I said, there are no games. They're all terrible. All gaming landscape is dead to me. There hasn't been anything good since something nostalgic that doesn't exist anymore. It's soulless mobile. It's uh, And off I went. It could have been a talk. And after I'd finished and I'd, I'd said all this, she calmly handed me a cup of coffee and she said, well, it's Sunday afternoon, you're in your dressing gown and you're sitting down playing that bloody tank game again, which you've been playing obsessively for two years. And I went, yes, yes, but this isn't, this isn't, this isn't. She's a very smart lady. <laughs> I thought about it, and I was like, that's true. I have been playing the hell out of World of Tanks. Why have I never come out to it? Now, I'd met Victor years before. 
because they used to have these lunatic parties at E3, and I don't go to parties, but a friend of mine was a big party animal, and somehow he got to a party, and somehow they got me in, and somehow I ended up in some place with Victor, and it was all mad. I don't really remember much of it. It was just madness. It was just madness swirling around somehow. And God bless Victor. Too many people come up to him to talk to him. So he, 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 he had some sort of filtering system. And so I ended up in front of him, and someone had said, this is Paul, he plays tanks. And Victor smacked me on my back really hard, like almost grabbed hold of me, pulled me across, sat me down at a laptop, lit up a cigarette, said, play. <laughs> I was like, what? Play. You fucking play now. Okay, so, so I was like, oh, right, oh, so you come to meet Victory, you get to play tanks, that's not a bad deal. So there I was playing tanks. I was playing my beloved KV-1, and uh, I played my tanks, and he's watched. And at that point, Victor ignored every other person around there. There's all these other people trying to see him, and he was just sitting behind me, fucking cigarette, watching, 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 and I played three games. And then the guy who'd brought me over, the guy who'd done the introduction, because Victor didn't talk to me about it, he just went over to this guy, and smacked him. And he went, you can play. <laughs> and that was it. That was, my, that was my first meeting with Victor. And I didn't see him again for two years. True story. So there I was thinking, well, well, how can I do that? So I went and talked to all the people who love me and care for me, with the exception of my wife who had said you should play on tanks. And every single one of them said exactly the same thing. Don't go to wargaming. And I mean across the board. I couldn't find anyone who was like, oh yeah, yeah, that's the right place to go. They all said no. And I was like, oh, you're all saying, why are you all saying no? And when a, an awful lot of people were saying no, and I got very confused about it, because I was like, well, there must be something they know that I don't know. And the more that I hunted around and tried to figure it out, the more I came to the conclusion is that they didn't know anything. They were just making a judgment somehow, probably on the parties, I guess. And so instead, I went through the process of going, no, no, I do. I want, to go, I want to go see if I can work on tanks. So I then put a list together. And I decided that I wanted to work on what I loved. And loob loob tanky. Oh, yes. Me and the tanks were strong. I wanted happiness now. Not happiness in five years, not when shares vested, not potentially going and working on another project for three years. Of, I wanted happiness now. I wanted, to, I wanted to want to go to work. I wanted challenges. I wanted to be able to utilize the strong skill set I had. I'm not afraid of hard work, but I needed to go find it. I also wanted to prove that I could do it. Which is odd, because wargaming is quite a tricksy thing to understand if you're a Westerner. You feel like you can understand it from a distance, but that's just not true. It gets more complicated the closer you get, and you learn more things the more time you pay to it. And the more I thought about it, and the more I tried to distill what this moment was, I decided it was a moment of honesty. It required me to be honest about what I wanted as a game designer, what I wanted as a person, what I wanted to do with my time on the planet and what I was willing to give up that everyone was telling me not to give up. Don't leave California. Don't leave the Bay Area. Don't give up your share options. Don't give up the office of the chief creative officer. You're the senior creative director. What are you talking about? Don't go work for wargaming. Don't, 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 don't. And the funny thing is, there's a company that heard that. It was wargaming. People don't know from outside of Wargaming the hard road they went down, the decisions they had to make, the amount of no they had to accept, the amount of disbelief that they were faced with. Everyone told them no. Everyone said it couldn't be done. Everyone said they were wasting their time, just like they did when I was making my first games. Just like I got when I was a gamer, but I was dyslexic and I couldn't go to school and I couldn't get any exams. If you'd listened to these people, you wouldn't have got anywhere. And so, honesty. Honesty with me and then learning the honesty within Wargaming. To go up to them and say, I haven't got a silver bullet solution. I'm not a magical West Coast solve. 
I don't know better than you. I love tanks. I'm at Wargaming because I once again enjoy the business. I enjoy the business of making games. I hadn't given talks until I came back to Wargaming. I'd been off the talking circuit for five years because it was driving me crazy. I'm in meetings with people now and they have ideas and a desire and an attention to try and make things better and they want to learn and they want to share. And do you know what? They want to believe. The one thing that I enjoy is I talk to people at Wargaming and they turn around and they go, you are very, very positive about tanks. And I go, yeah. I am very positive about tanks. I think it is deeply underexploited and has an awful lot still to give. Because they've been at the coal face for so long. I haven't quite, let's see that verse or so. But then when, when I wake them up, when they get that enthusiasm, Man, they knock down doors, they get features, they do great stuff. So uh, I learned to enjoy the making of the game. It's very unusual, I talk to designers, um, making games is nothing like playing games. It's sort of like watching a magic trick and then having to perform a magic trick. And for a lot of designers, this act of stepping behind the curtain ruins games. And you can't play them anymore, because all you see is the, the numbers. But that's not true with tanks. I continue to enjoy it, which is lovely. And I love Wargaming not because of the company it is. I love Wargaming because of where it came from and how it got here and the company it is so desperately trying to be. It's a better company than it was two years ago. It's a better company than it was a year ago. It's a better company than it was two months ago. That's a great vector to be on. And when I distilled all that down, I decided it was a love affair. I love tanks. I love Wargaming, and they seem to love me, so it's all working out well. I love our players, even our fierce ones. I like Wargaming because they're still interested in ideas rather than target markets. I mean, they understand target markets, we've got to pay attention to target markets, but they're still excited by ideas. There's room to grow. The company was self-started. It did a lot of really impressive things, but it wants to grow. There's room to grow. That's a great reason to be here. Will to win. That's much better than hitting your quarterly business target. It's much better than worrying about the share price. I like winning. In Wargaming, we squabble and fight and argue. And some people don't like other people and say they smell. And sometimes we talk about how they've stolen something off us and we're not very happy about it. But that's because we're more like a family than a company. And family squabble. They also stick together. And if you come at us from the outside, we draw ranks. It's interesting. I'm a big fan. And it put me back into a flow. Remember I talked about game flow? A flow of game making. And I'm back into a game making flow. And then I looked around and realized that at Wargaming, what I've discovered is my gaming family. I've gone all the way back to my childhood. I talk passionately and warmly and argue and fight, just like I did when I was first a gamer. But now I get to do it at Wargaming on my favorite game that I still play the hell out of. And therefore, the short answer, gaming, my soul, it was saved by Wargaming, for which I'm eternally thankful. Thank you very much.